I have become aware of companies that are 3D printing suppressor designs for the express purpose of being able to use 3D printing as a marketing term so they can charge you more money for it. Also, real quick, why I've got you guys' attention, check your subscription and notification settings. Make sure that they're the way that you left them. I've got a lot of notifications from you guys telling me that you were unsubscribed without being unsubscribed. So, again, just make sure that it's the way that you left it. And if you feel so inclined, please like and share the video. It helps spread it around so more people can see it. And I think this is one that people should know about. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching the VSO Gun Channel. And today we're going to be talking about suppressors again. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the topic of 3D printed suppressors and what you need to know about this product category going into 2026 before that tax stamp is reduced to zero dollars that may influence your purchasing decisions. That and more after we hear a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Excess Sites. Quite frankly, they are my go-to site. I've been using them for over a decade at this point in time. I gravitate towards their big dot site, but they have a whole bunch of different configurations out there that suit whatever need you have, whether it's a fiber optic, whether it's a tritium, doesn't matter. Race suppressor sites, they even make rails for lever guns. They make sight bases, shotguns, rifles, pistols, all of it. So I highly recommend that you go check them out, and I thank them for being a longtime supporter of the mission here at the VSO Gun Channel. Whenever we use the term additive manufacturing, most of us, our minds go to a, a hobbyist apparatus that sits on like a tabletop or something like that, that has a, a head that goes around and squirts out hot filament and is used to build 3D models, usually out of polymer of some persuasion, like PLA. And that technology can be used to produce suppressors. But what I would say to you is that even if we're talking about low caliber uh, applications like 22 and stuff like that, those items should be considered disposable items, which when it comes to the status quo in 2026 with the tax stamp going down to zero dollars, disposable suppressors kind of have a new life breathe into them because you no longer initiate a, a $200 sin tax every single time you manufacture one of those things or purchase and transfer one of those things, right? So maybe there is a space for that sort of thing if that's something that you want. You can also integrate that with other materials. Like for instance, if you had a 22 suppressor that was all 3D printed out of some kind of polymer material, but had a fully stainless steel like blast chamber or something like that, then that might increase its longevity considerably. Personally speaking, I have limited experience with the disposable suppressor category, but I am willing to learn about the new materials that are being used because there are new polymers that are being created every day that are being forced into service in this area. And there are some really interesting designs that I have become appraised of over the course of the last several months that might actually get there. I will tell you this, that they still do sort of rely on that concept that I gave you already, which is there's some other kind of metal thing in there that soaks up some of that before we get to the rest of the stack. Okay, so just... As far as we're speaking in December of 2025, just in your brain, plant the seed that if it is a polymer constructed suppressor, those things are not built to handle sustained fire, the temperatures or the pressures, or both of them combined. That's what kills suppressors. And that's why they're made out of stainless steel and ink and L and stuff like that. Even aluminum suppressors are not designed to take sustained rapid fire for in any period of time they will melt i have personally done it so when we speak about 3d printing suppressors specifically usually what we're talking about is a process called direct laser sintering which to very 
heavily paraphrase. Think of it as a powdered alloy in a chamber, and it has a laser head that goes around, creates plasma, and it melts that that alloy dust onto the surface that it's printing on. And it allows you to build a three-dimensional thing out of that. I know of 3D printed Inconel suppressors. And for all intents and purposes, they are just as rugged as if they were traditionally machined out of the original alloy. There might be a small little bit of something there, but you can consider it pretty much one-to-one to the original alloy. That technology is not really cheap. One of the things about 3D printing, especially these days, when we're talking about the polymer side of stuff, is it allows you to rapidly prototype, which is considerably faster than making, and more cost-effective than making a mold and injection molding various iterations of prototypes before you go to final production. In fact, I'm going to SHOT Show here in a couple weeks, and I guarantee you that I will hold no fewer than 50 3D printed prototypes or pre-production models, they may call them. When it comes to direct laser sintering, that is not exactly a cheap process to do. It is less expensive usually to manufacture via traditional manufacturing means. So the question is, why do it? Well, there's a couple reasons you might use direct laser sintering or for the rest of the video, we're gonna call it 3D printing. There's a reason that you may use 3D printing to manufacture a can. I think the best answer for that is that it is something that can't really be made through traditional manufacturing means. So usually when you've got something that's coming in, a tool that's coming in to carve metal off, you have to have an angle of attack, a direction of attack that the tool comes in. And because of that, you are somewhat limited by the direction that tool comes from. Now, there are multi-axis machines that can change the direction of the work and all that sort of stuff, but for the most part, you should assume that if you're using some kind of traditional manufacturer means like a lathe or a mill that you're going to have some limitations on what you can do what you can do in any single operation. You may have to do multiple operations to get that thing done versus sticking it in the thing, telling it to create the design and it builds it. That allows you to create intricate geometry that otherwise would not be able to be made. Here's the kicker in a single piece, cut it into several pieces. Think like a baffle stack, for instance. So if you wanted to make a one piece suppressor that had all the bells and whistles in it, but did not have any parts to come apart, did not have any junctions or anything like that, is one solid hunk of metal. Well, your only option to do that then is direct laser sintering. The other reason that you might do that, for instance, is probably what we're going to see in 2026 is there is going to be very little machine time volume available for these kind of devices in 2026, especially if we have any protracted conflicts that we get involved in. Machine time is going to be king and suppressor manufacturing is going to pale in comparison to some other more lucrative things that companies could be doing. A lot of companies that have big CNC machines and things like that produce their own stuff, then they contract the rest of the time out there for other people to purchase. If that machine is not running, it is losing money, basically, is how you should consider the equation. So whenever we have a massive manufacturing haul, certain things just fall off. You might use direct laser sintering, for that purpose to soak up some of that volume. However, the whole reason that I am making this video today, because you could have looked up any of that information that I just gave you on the internet from multiple sources, is that I have become aware of 
companies that are direct laser centering suppressor designs for the purposes of being able to use it as a marketing term, to be able to charge extra for what it is that they are doing. So there is the legitimate uses for this. And then there are companies that are just doing it for the purposes of being able to say that they did it so they can charge you a premium. If a company, for instance, is cutting like K-baffles, which is like the one of the oldest suppressor baffle designs that, that exists. If a company is cutting K-baffles out of a 3D printing machine and stuffing them in a tube, then that is likely not a legitimate use of the technology. They're probably doing that for the purposes of trying to make their product seem more sophisticated than it actually is, or making their product seem like a more premium product when this is technology that has existed for years. Okay, so the purpose of me making this video today is to put something in your mind when somebody says that this can is 3D printed and they mean direct laser centering, DLS, why is the question that should come to your mind. If you look at it and you're like, wow, that thing is really intricate, right? Like that thing is super strong. It's made out of like Inconel and it's got all kinds of crazy webs in it and all that sort of stuff. Send it. Probably a good use of the technology. But if somebody has got like a tube and baffle can and it's got like a whole bunch of different baffles that go together and they're pretty simplistic in their design, you have to ask yourself, what am I paying for when I purchase this device? Am I paying for the marketing and the name attached to it? Or am I paying for a suppressor that is actually better because they use the technology properly? Because one-to-one, -one, a can that is made of the same alloy that uses the same baffle technology, one direct laser centered and one made through traditional manufacturing means, are going to be equivalent. 3D printing does not magically make the device better. It's how the technology is used. And that is the message that I want to impart to you. Be on the lookout because there's going to be a whole bunch of companies that are spooling up and they're going to use that as a marketing term. It's already being used as a marketing term and you will see it quite a bit in 2026. I mark my words. I want you to understand that perspective, understand where the companies are coming from, understand where the market is, and scrutinize those things before you commit to a purchase like that. If you found this video informative in any way or you learned something, then please share this video out, send it to all your friends that need to see it, and bookmark it as uh, something that you can send to somebody later when they're talking about whether they should be purchasing a specific device or not. I just want you guys to stretch your money to the greatest degree possible because I think that in 2026, there is going to be a supply and demand problem when it comes to these devices. And some companies are going to take advantage of that where others are going to conduct themselves in a legitimate manner. Thank you for watching and hopefully we'll see you on another video here at the VSO Gun Channel.